This is the Real Estate Happy Hour, and I'm your host, Chris Wright. It's a fun place where we talk real estate, pop culture, and what's trending. Hey, I might even give you some good advice. So grab yourself a drink, sit back, relax, and take a listen. Unless you're driving, of course. I'll see you guys on the other side. Hey everybody, this is the Real Estate Happy Hour. I'm your host, Chris Wright, and this is episode one. So what is the Real Estate Happy Hour about? We're just gonna have a good time and it's gonna be short and sweet. So I call it happy hour because what do you typically do at happy hour? You drink, right? So I'm gonna talk about some of my favorite drinks. So today I'm gonna talk about Bullet Old Fashioned Cocktail, okay? And this is a pre-mixed old fashioned in a bottle, looks just like this. And um, it is so good. Now, I typically don't like pre-mixed cocktails in bottles. They usually, like if you get a Long Island iced tea in a bottle, it tastes nothing like Long Island iced tea. And most of those mixed drinks don't. But Bullet hit the nail on the head with this one. If you like Old Fashions or um, Manhattans, this is it. All you need to do basically is add an orange slice and you're dead. You're there, right? Or you can add a maraschino cherry or whatever you want. But for my happy hour today, let's go with the bullet old fashioned cocktail. All right. So let's jump right into real estate. So what even prompted this idea to do this podcast is I was on TikTok and shout out to Lee Brown because she did a TikTok about this viral video of this girl who um, was complaining, oh, I can't buy a house. I don't make enough money. I need 20% down, whatever, whatever it was. But then I went down a rabbit hole and I saw video after video of people giving advice on real estate. People who weren't even in, in the industry, just people saying, don't buy a house. I can't buy a house. It's stupid to buy a house. It's a dumb investment to buy a house. And some of these people were influencers and some of them were just everyday people like you and I. And it just made me think about why wouldn't you invest in something that's legacy, something that you can hold on to. Now, I get it. When you are 25 years old, sometimes it's even worse when you're older and you have to think about something like a 30 year mortgage or I'll never own this house. Or it costs costs way too much. You got to rethink that. Like real estate is something that you can call your own. You can do whatever you want with it. You can re, you can decorate it. You can buy a fixer upper and make it your own. You can buy something that's moving ready or new construction. But here's the thing about it: it it appreciates in value. So you may buy something today that's two hundred thousand dollars and. It could be worth 250 in one year, 300 in three years. And it just appreciates and appreciates and appreciates. This happens most of the time. But when you are renting, those properties never really appreciate in value. And I know what some people out there say, I've heard this one, but you don't own it. The bank owns it. Yeah, but you are paying for it over a period of time. And who says that you have to do a 30 year mortgage? Some people live by a 15, a 15 year fix. If you're 25 or you're 27 and you're going to pay off that house by the time you're 35 or less, you could, uh, you could be a 40 year old who owns their house outright. So I just want to tell you that whole thing of don't buy a house, don't buy a house. There's ways to get around it. There's ways to get around the economic condition that we're currently in the down payment, You just got to save your chips. You got to work hard. You know, my friend Lee talked about working a second job or just, you know, eating rice and beans until you can get to a point where you can save enough for a down payment to buy a house. So when you go on TikTok or so any social media platform and you keep hearing, don't buy a house, don't buy a house and you're going to rent forever. Long term, it just does not make sense. All right. You want to invest in something as soon as possible. The other thing, interest rates are high. Well, the interest rates 
are in the same place they were about seven years ago. When I bought a house in 2007, I think my interest rate was rate was 8.5. And now we're back up to seven. So they dipped down to two and three percent. But guess what? If you wait for the interest rate to go up, then the housing prices are just going to go up. So you can't really beat the system. You either got to take the interest rate or you take the price. Take your pick. Right now, I would rather take the interest rate. I would rather take the interest rate right now, high interest rate, and then get a good price because that same house is going to appreciate four to seven percent in value over the next year. Choose your battle. I would rather have the money. Four percent increase of two hundred fifty thousand dollars is a lot better situation than waiting for an interest rate to come down that may not ever come down or it may take a few years to come down and you're still renting. You do the math, all right? So that's my real estate rant for today. All right, let's go into some fun stuff. What's trending? So I wrote down a couple of things. So Britney's book is out. Britney Spears' book is out. And yes, we've lived through the last few years of watching Britney Spears be a train wreck. And now she wrote a book. I forgot what the book's called. If you know what the book's called, Let me know. Just look up Britney Spears book. I forgot to look that up when I was doing my research. Anyway, the big topic topic in there is that she had an abortion and the father of this aborted child was Justin Timberlake. Now he's catching hell all over Instagram and Twitter. And basically he's gone in the dark. He's not responding. He just hopes it goes away. But basically what Britney said in her book was that he said he wasn't ready to be a father yet and that he kind of coerced her into having an abortion, but she couldn't have the abortion in an abortion clinic. She actually had to have it at home. That way the media would find out. And this is why we're finding out about this. Well, I don't know. It's 20 years later, whatever, but that's juicy, but also kind of sad that she had to have this abortion nurse or whatever, or doctor. Maybe they brought all the equipment to the house. I didn't read the book. I'm reading all this from people.com and other tabloids. Um, But salacious, but yet kind of disturbing that Justin Timberlake coerced her into having an abortion. And these people came over to the house and kind of like did the abortion in the bathroom. She said she was upset. She was crying. So According to the tabloid, Justin pulled out his guitar, sat on the floor with her in the bathroom and started serenading her, playing a guitar and singing to her. Let's hope he wasn't singing Cry Me a River. I don't know. (laughs) All right. What else is out there? Taylor Swift's um, new album, 1989, came out today. And um, so you say, you know, 1989 is not new. It's Taylor's version. You guys know the backstory behind this because I don't want to talk about Taylor Swift, even though I'm a Taylor Swift fan, but I don't want to talk about her every happy hour. Um, But I will say, if you don't understand what's going on, Taylor Swift is doing Taylor's versions because when she did the first album, Scooter Braun was her manager promoter, but he owned the rights to all of her stuff. And she's getting around it by re-recording them and putting them back out there. Now, all the Swifties in the world, and there's millions of them, they're rebuying her albums under Taylor's version. She did some things like change the arrangements, maybe change some instruments, change some of the vocal arrangements and things like that. So, 1989 came out today. I'm a little excited. All right, so can't wait to listen to that. But if you do want to explore Taylor Swift and you want to figure out, well, what's the difference? Some of her previous albums like Red and Speak Now and, uh, you know, things like that have come out normal. The old ones that came out when they came out and the Taylor's versions and you listen to them side by side. The new ones are just incredible. So 1989 came out today. And what else is in the news? The whole Israeli-Palestine stuff. I don't want to get too heavy or deep on this particular podcast, but I think you should educate yourself about it. Do as much research as possible. 
Um, it's not about taking a side because people are dying. Um, this is real world and people are dying. People are maimed. People are injured. And um, it's not something to take light of. But there are polls out there that talks about U.S. support, where our tax money is going, how we're um, helping the Israelis buy weapons and you also got to look at the other side. Men, women, children um, are dying in Gaza because they're being attacked. But it's trending. And I suggest you just don't scroll through TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and listen to the chatter. Do some actual research. <clears throat> and don't just listen to the news. Because I believe news is biased based on political affiliation and who that network is supporting and things like that. Again, don't want to get too heavy on this particular podcast, but do your research. I have my opinion. And if you want to know, just ask me. All right. So those are the things that are trending um, on social media. All right. So what's streaming on Netflix and other social media networks? There's a new movie out called Pain Hustlers. Um, this resonated with me because I used to be a pharmaceutical representative. Um, it stars Emily Blunt, who you might remember from The Devil Wears Prada. I like Emily Blunt. She's done, she's done some other things, too. Um, that's really, really good. So it's about this broke mom who gets into pharmaceutical sales and she makes some bad decisions. Pharmaceutical reps can make bad decisions. So also, if you watch anything about painkillers, there's a lot of uh, documentaries and TV series like Dope Sick and stuff like that about the painkiller or the opioid epidemic. So I'm going to watch Pain Hustlers next. Um, also, I'm watching Get Gotti, which is a documentary about uh, the rise and fall of John Gotti. Has always been one of my favorite characters in um, history and news because of the way he handled being the godfather of New York. John Gotti was an interesting character. Um, his, get, his, his reign and... Um, his uh, legend is kind of getting older because of when he was the godfather in the late 80s. And then in the 90s, there was a lot of uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, hip hop songs and music and about John Gotti. But he was almost like this iconic legend folklore type godfather who ran the mafia. Speaking of happy hour, this is Celsius. My favorite energy drink, sports drink. Anyway, so John Gotti. So there's a documentary about John Gotti on Netflix. It's called Get Gotti. Highly recommend it. I'm on episode two right now. There's only three. So it's a quick, it's a quick watch. Each episode is like 47 minutes long. Highly recommend it. So far, it's good. Movies. Um, I'm watching Old Dads. And now, oh my God, it's Bill Burr, Bokeem Woodbine, and Bobby Cannavale. Um, I think that's how you say his name, but it's about these uh, Gen X dads and they're trying to navigate through society and um, figure out how to be a parent today when there's so many Gen X or I'm sorry, Gen Z parents today, millennial parents today, and uh, they just don't fit in. But it's really funny. Uh, my wife and I started watching it, but I had to cut it off because the language is <laughs> it's like an F-bomb every one minute. And they talk about, you know, um, very sexual, suggestive stuff. So um, I highly recommend you watch it. It seems funny. Um, kind of like uh, Sebastian Maniscalco's last stand-up, where he just talked about just being too old to fit in sometimes. But I'm up there. I'm a Gen Xer, almost a boomer. Um, so I want to make sure that... Uh, but it's funny. I get what they're saying. A lot of politi politically correct stuff, but if you call it politically correct, then you'll be... You could tell that you're an older person. All right, what else is out there? Oh, Beckham. My wife watched Beckham. It's about the um, the life and career of soccer star David Beckham. And I've also seen um, a lot of social media posts about this particular documentary. Quite a few episodes, um, hour each one. But he's an interesting character. And everybody know he's in a relationship with Posh Spice, I believe of the uh, Spice Girls. So Beckham. So then, of course, streaming this month is Halloween movies. Tell me about your last ones, the ones you like, the ones you watched. 
Um, we only got a few more days. Tuesday's Halloween. So if you don't watch them by then, then you might as well just wait till next year. Um, a big one that popped up recently is the Blair Witch Project. A lot of people are watching that again. Halloween, the, the series. Um, Saw is out there. The new Exorcist is out. Exorcist Believers. Um, on Netflix, there's a, a movie called House of the Fall, The Fall of the House of Usher, which is an Edgar Allan Poe book. So Halloween movies, it's kind of trending right now. All right, next, Mailbag. All right, so um, I get questions every week, whether I get phone calls or emails. Hopefully that people will email me and send me messages. I wanted to pick out two and talk about those. So this one was, um, how do I save money to buy a house? It's getting back into the real estate theme. So typically there's, first of all, I want to talk about a couple of things when I talk about money to buy a house. So first, the best way, the most, the smartest way is to save money to buy a house. So if you're renting and you don't have a lot of money to buy a house, there are ways to buy a house with no money down and also borrowing your closing costs. I don't recommend those ways and they're out there and we could talk about those at another time. But this question is how do I save money to buy a house? So come up with a three to five year plan that you might be renting for three to five years or maybe two years. Maybe you're just a good saver. All right. I would take a very, very large chunk of every paycheck and put it in a money market. So what's a money market? A money market is a savings account that you can actually get money out quickly, but you can't get to easily, which means you might have to make send an email or make a phone call to your financial advisor and say, I need a couple thousand dollars. And then what they will do in turn is draw up the withdrawal and you'll get it in a couple of days or a few days. That's money you can't touch very easily. Now, why do I say put it in a money market? Is because if money is, is in your savings a banking account, all it takes is a swipe of a debit card. When you want to go out to dinner, um, if you see a purchase you want to make, you just go get it. You just, if someone has, like your friend comes, hey, let me borrow $50. You're mm-hmm. like, yeah. And you just go ahead and go to the ATM and get them $50. But if money is in a money market, you can't easily touch it. So I always recommend, I'm going to recommend taking a nice chunk of your paycheck, 10, 15, 20%, a large chunk and put it in the money market. Call up your financial advisor and go, hey, take $1,000 out of my account. Take $500 out of my account. They'll take it. They'll put it in the money market, okay? And then you just keep doing it. You do it consistently. It'd be great if you could take that money market and you have it come out of automatic withdrawals. You can set that up with your financial advisor too, where he would just take your money weekly or monthly. It's not high interest. It's hardly any interest at all. But it's your money that's going to an account that you can't touch and it's not easy to get to. Highly recommend doing that because if you're not a good saver or if you're not someone who, oh, I see money in my account, especially when it's on your phone, right? It's so easy to pick up your phone and go, how much is in my account? And the next thing you know, you're pulling it out or you're borrow- you're loaning to someone or you're sending it to DraftKings and you're betting with it. Guilty. Anyway, so um, that is one way. So save money. You want to save um, 15, uh, 15 to 20% is ideal. So, but at least save 35 to 5% plus additional sums for your closing costs. So I would say save $20,000 to some of you. That may sound like a lot, but for others, saving $20,000, you could do in a few years, maybe two or three. And then for some of you, you spend $20,000 on the weekend, ballers, right? So as quickly as you can get 20 to 30 and the more, the better. Somebody goes, how much? What do I need to buy a house? If you um, have a more moderate, modest income and you only make 40 to $50,000 a year, then I'm going to suggest that you try and save five to 6,000 a year for the next few years. But anybody that comes to me and I say, how much do you have prepared to buy a house? I always say, and if they tell me I got $20,000, I go, you're golden. But if you can get more, the more the better. I bought my house on a VA loan. 
I wish that I didn't um, have to, but I was getting up there in age. My wife had been, and I had been together a while and I bought the zero down um, option. But I always recommend to people that you do 15 to 20% down. All right. So, but that's how you save money to buy a house. I would say anywhere that you could save money um, where you're not going to be penalized by the government for taxes and a money market, you are not penalized. But if you put it in a 401k or some type of investment account, like a Roth 401, when you pull that money back out, it goes in untaxed, but when it come out, it's taxed. So you want to make sure that you don't put the money in that type of account. Now, if you're saving for retirement, you definitely put it into that type of account. But if you're saving for a home or a large purchase like a home, money market. All right. Oh, by the way, disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. These are just things I've learned from financial advisors and reading money books and about things about being responsible. All right. The next question from my money bag is, how do I get out of debt? Oh, God. All right. So how do I get out of debt? So credit card debt is the number one way that people get into debt. It's psychological. So I'm reading this book. Oh, where's the book? I had a book. Uh, I must have put it up. Anyway, it's over there. I'm not going to go get it. So I'm reading a book, a really, really good book called The Psychology of Money. And what The Psychology of Money says, that whenever you don't spend cash, okay, so there's like levels to it, and this is deep. When you speak, when you spend cash, it's extremely emotional, which is why people don't like to carry cash in their pocket. We always say, oh, I don't keep cash because I spend it too fast. All right. But when you spend cash, you're more emotional about it. You're attached to it. You, you, you hold it tighter. All right. The further you get away from cash, the less emotional it is. Let me say that again. The further you get away from cash, the less emotional it is. Let me give you an example. You go into a furniture store and you say, I'm only spending cash. So what do you do? You look for the most economical way to buy that piece of furniture. Like I want to buy that couch, that love seat, that table and chair. I got to furnish my house. Now, if you got a wad of cash in your pocket, you'd be like, as you're counting off 20s, 50s, and $100 bills, it's going to be emotional because you're watching it leave your pocket. Okay, so that's that's emotion number one. All right, let's talk about emotion number two. I'm going to write a check. A check, knowing you have $10,000 in the bank, but yet someone says, write me a check. It's pen to ink, and it's not as hard as counting out bills. So it's a little bit, it's still cash, but it's less emotional because you're not touching the money. So you write a check at the furniture store for $1,400, a little bit easier than counting out $1,400. All right, next step, next emotion, plastic. It's your debit card. You look in your account. I got $10,000 in my account. I'm going to spend $1,400. Okay. So now you might say, Throwing that end table because it just feels a little less like you're spending money because you're about to swipe that car. All right. You know, it's your money and you know, it's going to come out, but you don't see it Im immediately. You don't feel it immediately. So you swipe the card. People use debit cards all the time. It's the number one way that people have overdraft fees because they swipe cards. You don't feel it. it's just like. Phew. So that's a, that's the third emotion. The next emotion, credit cards. I'm not paying for it today. I'll have to pay for it, but I'm not paying today. And it ain't my money. And I can spend $1,400 and all I have to do is pay $50 this month or next month or $50 over a period of time. And then we even don't even consider the 18% or the 19% interest on top of that. It just feels easier to use a credit card, much less attached than even the debit card, because we know the debit card's coming out of our bank account. But the credit card, eh, that's something I worry about later. So not only throwing that end table, so throwing that end table too. 
And you know what? Go ahead and throw in that comforter set too. Yeah. And what else did I get? Ooh, those bar chairs look really nice. Less emotion and we just have a more willingness to spin. All right. And then the fifth emotion is revolving debt or revolving credit. Where the furniture store says, no, 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 no. Don't put that on your credit card. I can get you approved for, I don't know, Wells Fargo or whatever company they work with. You're all approved, Mr. Wright. Great. And it's zero, zero interest for the first six to 12 months. Oh, that's even better. And if you pay this off in 12 months, no interest. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> so then you're even more likely to get more. Then go ahead and throw in the bedroom set. Oh my God, since there's no interest, go ahead and give me that bar set right there. And oh, how much is that picture on the wall? I'll take that too. So the further you get away from cash, the more likely you are to spend and then create debt. So how do I get out of debt? Number one, get rid of your credit cards. Pay them down. Lock them up in a safe deposit box in your in your house. Don't carry them in your pocket. Because if you carry them in your pocket, you'll buy a Snickers bar on it. Because you go in your wallet, you see a debit card, debit card, credit card. Snickers bar is $2.50. That's just freaking ridiculous. And you'll be like, I have this Apple Watch. Very easy to put all my credit cards on it. So I just would tap to pay. Beep. So don't put credit cards on your smart devices. Beep. Credit cards. And you know what you say is you say, oh, I, I put everything on my credit cards and I just pay it off at the end of the month. Okay. All right. But what you're doing is you're creating a habit. All right. So am I guilty of still doing this sometimes? Sometimes it's by mistake. But I have built... I have insulated myself with always knowing that no matter what I spend and where I spend it, it's coming out my pocket. So other ways, other things that people say is <clears throat> I do it for airline points or so there was a survey done um, with airline, um, with credit card companies, particular, particularly um, airline credit cards, companies like Southwest, American Airlines, et cetera, United, they all got credit cards. And they realized that if I offer you points to fly, you'll use your credit card more. Like even one of the 25,000 points. Oh, the airport, in the airport, in the terminal, or when you're buying a ticket, it says sign up today and this flight will be free. People, oh my God, millions of people are in the airport terminals filling out credit cards. So to get 25, 50,000 points, but these, this, this, this study, I said survey, but this study showed that if you use a credit card for points, the credit card company thinks, gotcha, because they know that you'll continue to do that. And then ultimately in time, you will get to a point where you can no longer keep paying that off at the end of the month or you will choose to do something else, or you'll book a vacation. So a lot of these Southwest, and I don't mean to pick on Southwest, but I'm just saying any particular airline or hotel, Hilton, Marriott, they all have credit cards. IHG, which has Holiday and Express and a bunch of other hotel, it's a big conglomerate. All these travel type cards are a gotcha company, and they want you to get their card so you can, oh, I got to travel this weekend. I'm going to see my sister in California. I'm going to get points anyway. And when I'm going to pay it off at the end of the month, they know that smart, there's, there's a couple of different types of buyers that smart purchasers or smart credit card users, they will pay it off at the end of the month, but they just can't wait when those little small one night rooms become two night rooms become six night rooms. Oh, wait a minute. I can stay for a week and two of my nights are on points. So I can get two nights free and stay for seven. Or you know what? We get round trip to Hawaii and my flight there is free, but I'll just be paying for the flight back. 
They're counting on the time when you just booked the whole Disney trip on it. They're counting on you to have to take a job where you make less money and now you're paying less payments. They know that there are really, really smart credit card holders out there, but there's going to come a time where we're going to be master and you're going to be slave. So they give these cards up very easily. So the best way to get out of debt is to stop using credit cards. It's so hard. It's become part of our culture. It's become part of society. And by the way, someone said, I'm going to give it this to, I think I heard it on a Dave Ramsey show. He said that the quickest way to wealth is our income. I'll say that again. The quickest way to wealth is our income. Read his book, The what is it called? Um, the Total Money Makeover. See that row of books that all look the same? That's The Total Money Makeover. And the reason I have multiple copies is when I work with people, you buy a house with me, I give you that book. I buy them by the case. And the reason I give you that book is because when, after you've bought your house, now I have, I have hopes that you've learned how to manage your money prior to buying the house. But once you buy the house, I really, really, really want you to be more responsible about paying down debt, getting rid of credit cards, and then um, being financially responsible. Because in my household, I manage money. And when emergency emergencies arise, um, it's pretty much on me to make sure that we're prepared for those emergencies. Right? So, um, then the next thing is revolving debt. So you pay down credit cards and then you also pay down your revolving debt. Those are places like I talked about at the furniture store. Like you went to the furniture store, you bought your house, your, your furniture on credit or your bed or your mattress or whatever you bought. Or you go to Home Depot and you just got a whole bunch of stuff or you got a housing, a home renovation or a contractor built a deck for you and you got a home equity loan and things like that. So one, and lastly, one thing I do want to say about um, home equity line line of credit. I, I've done one or home equity loans or people say I'm going to make my home equity work for me is that you're not really paying off debt as much as you're moving debt. So don't get into the don't get tricked up by thinking that I'm going to get a home equity line of credit and I'm going to pay off debt. It will make your debt seem smaller because when you have fourteen hundred dollars a month um, that you were paying on bills. Now, if you get a home equity line of credit, home equity, now that might become seven to $800 because you've consolidated it, but you did not pay off anything. You just moved it. And sometimes you might need to do that, but it's not recommended. Um, if you don't have to, I got myself in a bind where I had too much debt I had you know, college loans and too many car payments and high credit card balances. And I said, I got to do what I don't recommend and get a a home equity line of credit. And also I was making some career choices too. But but like I said, only in those type of cases, if you have to do it, you got to do what you got to do. So that's how you get out of debt. You stop, you know, credit cards and stop getting revolving debt and then live off what you can afford. And if you need to take your Amazon app off your phone. All right. So I talked about the um that was in my mailbag and my sage advice today and i'll just go back to uh what i talked about in the psychology of money sage advice is remember the psychology of money and that's cash is the most emotional resource in your pocket your income and how it leaves and then the least um the, the least hard thing to do uh, is, uh, or at least emotional thing to do. That's what I was trying to say is credit. So when you're buying everything out of your bank account, out of cash, the further you get away from those green dollar bills, the less emotional it's going to be. So that's my sage advice today. It was going to be something else, but I thought about, I gave you something to think about. Um, and there you go. So real estate, happy hour, bullet, old fashioned cocktail. Just pour it on the rocks, add an orange slice. If you want to add a maraschino cherry, rock on. You guys take care. I will talk to you next week at the next Real Estate Happy Hour. You guys take care.